Welcome to Animalia. Coming up, this is Jumpin, an elephant with a foot that was badly injured by a landmine. Ling Ling is a popular panda at a Tokyo Zoo. We have the story on a very romantic journey that she's undertaken. Pretty flamingos in Kuwait have come all the way from Turkey and Iran, but their environment is threatened. And believe it or not, donkeys in Afghanistan are bringing education to the nomads there. All that and more coming right up on Animalia. In Thailand, 50 stray dogs from a Bangkok pound have been selected by the Thai Police Canine Subdivision to be trained for police dog duties. Following the popularity of the King of Thailand's book about his dog, which sold an amazing 100,000 copies within hours of its publication, the National Police Office and the Ministry of Justice have jointly created a training project for stray dogs. The program seeks to help alleviate problems caused by the estimated 100,000 stray dogs that roam the streets of Bangkok by using the dogs to assist in future police operations. The dogs, all around one year old, had to be healthy, neutered and given rabies shots. Prior to this initiative, Thai police have only used canines of foreign breeds such as Dobermans, German Shepherds, Labradors and Retrievers. However, these purebreds come with a heavy price tag of around 30,000 baht. As tens of thousands of stray dogs roam the streets of Bangkok, they can be picked up and trained by the canine subdivision at a far lower cost. The police canine subdivision visited a pound in Bangkok to select suitable dogs for their training program. Fifty lucky canine candidates have been granted a second lease on life and will be trained to sniff for drugs and explosives and hunt down criminals. Army and prison units in Thailand are also looking into utilizing stray dogs. One of the obstacles faced in training stray dogs is that some of them have been abused and are not comfortable around people. Their handlers therefore have to prepare the animals psychologically first. The grueling training program is expected to last 20 weeks. In the first 10 weeks, the dogs will be taught basic obedience, followed by a two-month course involving police tasks. If the first batch proves successful, the National Police Office will continue with the project and take on more strays. The phenomenon has increased awareness of the stray dog problem in Bangkok. Happily, more people are now willing to adopt the strays as pets and give them new homes and a place in Thai society. You just have to be careful that they don't eat your car. Still in Thailand and Jumpin, a 23-year-old elephant was rushed to the elephant hospital in Lampang's Hangkat district, 600 kilometers north of Bangkok, after her left front foot was injured when she stepped on a landmine while foraging for food. Jumpin went missing from her home in Tak province on the Thai-Burmese border. Her handler, known as a mammoth, heard an explosion from inside Burma. Jumpin had stepped on a landmine. Four days later, a severely injured Jumpin made her way back to her village with her left forefoot torn to shreds by the impact of the explosion. But when the elephant's condition failed to improve, the caretaker contacted the Friends of the Asian Elephant Foundation for urgent assistance. Doctors at the center are fighting furiously to save Jumpin's foot after it became seriously infected. Treatment to control the infection, including painkillers, anti-inflammatories and antibiotics, is a delicate matter for such a large animal. Normally, elephants place about 70% of their 3.5 to 5.5 ton mass on their forefeet. Jumpin can't put any weight on her injured foot because of acute pain. 
She's among hundreds of elephants employed in the logging industry along the Thai-Burmese border. Many Thai families rely on elephants for their livelihood as approximately 1,500 elephants in the country work for money. Most of them are employed in the tourism industry as performers or as a form of transportation. These animals risk their lives every day with the ever-present danger of landmines laid by Burmese troops fighting ethnic rebels. Dr. Preacher Pongam, the vet in charge of Jumpin's treatment, is having her soak her foot in disinfectant to control the infection. He's not determined the exact course of her treatment, and until lab results have been made clear, he's not ruled out amputating the elephant's foot. Matala, a 39-year-old elephant, was the first landmine victim to be admitted to the elephant hospital four years ago and is currently awaiting her prosthetic foot. Dr. Pongom remains hopeful about Jumpin's fate as her wounds are less severe than Matala's. The Thai government estimates there are 4,000 elephants currently roaming the country. Since a single elephant needs about 5,000 acres to survive, it's remarkable that only seven have been injured by landmines. Jumpin's story also reflects the hardship of other elephants and mammoths who've been forced to work in areas filled with landmines to ensure their survival. Meanwhile in Tokyo, Lingling, Ling, Ueno Zoo's resident panda, has set off on a mission to impregnate female pandas in Mexico and recoup his reputation as a stud after two previous visits failed to produce results. A popular exhibit at the zoo, the media was out in force to record Ling Ling's departure. The only panda at the Tokyo Zoo was put in a cage and loaded onto a truck to embark on yet another mission to try to impregnate female pandas in Mexico. The panda, now 17, was sent home last year after failing a second time to romance females at the Chapel Tipic Zoo in Mexico City. Subsequent attempts to artificially inseminate the three female pandas at the Mexican zoo also failed. Only about a thousand pandas live in the wild atop foggy, bamboo-covered mountains in western China, so it's hoped they will have some success in the breeding project. Zookeepers fed the middle-aged panda pieces of sugar millet through the bars of his cage before bidding farewell to Ling Ling, who has a 13-hour flight ahead of him. In the wild, female pandas usually give birth to a single cub only once every two to three years. And it's proven difficult to tempt those protected in zoos to mate. A lonely Ling Ling, who probably has only another two to three years left as a potential stud, has been the sole panda at the zoo since the death in July 2000 of a female, Tong Tong. Every winter, flocks of flamingos migrate to Kuwait, flying all the way from Turkey and northern Iran. These rare and beautiful birds are looking for a warmer climate and better food. But the speedy urbanization of Kuwait City threatens the birds' natural habitat and could force them to seek other lands. Seeing flocks of flamingos nestling near Kuwait City isn't unusual, but soon such sights could become rare. They settle primarily near Kuwait Bay and search for sandy beaches, fish and a safe environment. But the fast urbanization of Kuwait and burning oil threatens the birds. Dr. Khaled Al Ghanim of the Natural Reserve Division has been watching these birds for years. He comes to Kuwait Bay once a week to watch flamingos nestling on a small island right opposite US Camp Doha. Very often, he says, the birds don't come at all. The environmental authorities plan to establish a special reservation for the rare birds and the animals living in the area, but nothing has been done so far. The flamingos spread all over the Middle East, but in Kuwait, they were first tracked in the 1920s. Since then, they've been regular guests to the country. Stumbling over high mountain peaks and rocky valleys, donkeys are the only way that school books and stationery can reach nomad children in northern Afghanistan. These donkeys are bringing education to Afghan nomads 
who've been moved to the remote mountains of Parwan province for the winter. With more severe weather expected to arrive in the next few weeks, their slow trek is fast becoming a race against time. When snow falls through the mountains and valleys, this path will become inaccessible. So Afghan authorities and UNICEF are rushing to deliver school books and stationery to Namokab so that classes can carry on. The donkeys trek through this thin mountain pass loaded with textbooks, chalkboards, school bags and recreational materials. The donkeys also bring joy to the hundreds of nomadic school children of the village. These girls are the lucky ones. Under the strict Taliban rule of Afghanistan, girls weren't allowed to go to school or hold jobs and had to wear the all-covering burqa. The nomads couldn't understand how education could benefit their community, which is rooted in its nomadic pastoral history. But now they have their own school and 140 primary children are eagerly waiting the new supplies. Nearly a third of the 130,000 children are girls. Enjoying an afternoon siesta, these lions in a Beijing wildlife park have no idea they've been handpicked to replace Marjan at Kabul Zoo as a diplomatic peace offering. Beijing, battling safari animal world, have chosen two young lions from almost 80 African lions. Female Kani and male Zhuang Zhuang, who are almost three years old, are the chosen candidates. Chinese and Afghan officials have not said who will pay the transportation costs, but they hope to send them to Kabul anyway. <coughs> it's no easy task replacing Marjan, who ruled Kabul Zoo for almost 38 years. But Afghanistan's ambassador to China has visited the Beijing Wildlife Park to check out successes. While the lions will be welcomed in Kabul, life may be hard. In a country where locals go hungry, there are questions as to how the animals will be fed. At their current home, they consume three and a half kilos of prime beef every day. During the years of war in Afghanistan, Marjan was left to live in appalling conditions. He became blind in one eye, lame and almost toothless, with regular taunts and teasing from most of the visitors to the zoo. He was a gift from Germany some 38 years ago and endured Soviet occupation, coups and most recently the US bombing raids that ousted the Taliban. The park hopes the lions will produce an heir in Kabul. The Chinese park got in touch with Beijing city officials about arranging a successor for Marjan after local newspapers spread word of its plan. Let's hope that the two new visitors settle in and we wish them the best of luck. However, 20 years on the front line has left Kabul Zoo a shadow of its former self. Before the recent war, there were 700 animals there. Despite widespread publicity about its plight, international aid has been slow in coming. But now, relief is finally getting through to the impoverished zoo. Earlier this week, the zoo's first consignment of aid arrived from the United States. Food supplies for the handful of animals that managed to survive two decades of war. Zoo officials are hopeful that the coming months will mark a revival in the zoo's fortunes. But the zoo director admits that without foreign help, there's little chance of improving conditions for the 30 animals that still live at the zoo. A spokesman at the zoo said that international zoos have promised to provide everything, including the animals. The food arrives at irregular times and sometimes in huge bulk. Because there are only 30 animals currently in the zoo, the food is kept in underground cellars to keep cool and therefore fresh. A 24-hour guard keeps vigilance in case some of the food could be stolen for other purposes. North Carolina Zoo in the United States has raised over 300,000 US dollars to help rebuild the zoo. The hope is to reconstruct the facility as a national conservation park, featuring native animals such as leopards, gazelles and porcupines. The animals living there now are assured of one thing, 
They won't be going hungry as long as peace holds. <laughs> These cute little fellows have quite a few names. Woodchucks or whistle pigs. They are in fact stout-bodied marmots. But the most popular name is groundhog. Two groundhogs at Berlin Zoo are being transported to a barn where they'll spend the winter sleeping. After spending the summer in their outdoor enclosure, the groundhogs will hibernate for four to five months. They weigh between two and six kilograms. Found from the eastern and central United States northward across Canada and into Alaska, Groundhogs are animals of open fields and woodland edges, where they feed mainly on low green vegetation. They're terrestrial, but are good swimmers and climbers. They feed heavily in summer, storing fat to see them through their winter hibernation. Zookeeper Kurt Gerdeke said the groundhog will wake up at the end of March. Then we'll know that the winter is finally over. Mm -hmm. This event is always popular at the zoo with people anxious to get a glimpse of the sleepy animals. Kurt told us that the groundhog is in deep sleep over the winter. Its pulse decreases to three heartbeats a minute when it hibernates. They're also excellent diggers, constructing a burrow with a main entrance and an escape tunnel. Woodchucks are solitary except during the spring, when litters of four to five young are born. The young stay with the mother for about two months. Throughout the USA, groundhogs are brought out on February the 2nd to determine how much longer winter will prevail. The Groundhog Day legend began with a German superstition. It suggests that if a hibernating animal casts a shadow on the Christian holiday of Candlemas, winter will last another six weeks. No shadow indicates an early spring. The record is 90% accurate, but when it's still so early in the year, it's a pretty sure thing that the weather's going to stay cold anyway. The groundhogs were put into wooden boxes where they'll remain throughout the cold season. Some of the groundhogs, which are celebrated on Groundhog Day in the States, have names such as Wyatt and Willie and Shubanakadi Sam, but the most famous is Puxatawney Phil, the groundhog of whom a movie, Groundhog Day, was made starring Bill Murray. Still at Berlin Zoo and it's stock taking time. Long lists are compiled of how many animals live in Germany's oldest zoo. Recently released figures show a total of 11,933 animals from nearly 1,500 different species call Berlin Zoo their home. For some residents, like these seals, cooler weather allows a little more frisky behavior. visitors always enjoy their antics. The winter months also make the penguins feel right at home. Perhaps snow is not so familiar for some, like this African wild dog and her pups. Indoors, the extensive marine exhibit includes many weird and wonderful creatures from the deep. Tiny exotic jellyfish, barracuda, stingrays, eels and even sharks make the Berlin Zoo their home. The annual procedure of stock taking not only includes a head count, but many animals are also weighed and some even measured, such as the octopus. With the help of a ruler and an attraction such as a small crab, one zookeeper reached into the octopus tank and tried measuring the animal. The edible treat encouraged the eight-legged creature's cooperation. In a different building, a semi-ape known as a potto was weighed, and clearly it didn't enjoy the attention it was receiving from cameras. Pottos are active at night, and the bright neon light put the animal under considerable stress. 
I guess it's nice to know just exactly how many animals you have. Scientists in China have discovered fossils of a feathered four-winged dinosaur, which they say provides new evidence of the origin of avian flight. The scientists at Beijing's Institute of Vertebrate Paleontology and Paleoanthropology made the remarkable discovery in the country's northeastern province of Liaoning, a fossil-rich area of China. The creature, called Microraptor Gi, is less than a meter long and is thought to have glided from tree to tree, similar to flying squirrels, in an intermediary step before full flapping flight. Chinese researcher Zhu Jing said he believes the discovery of winged dinosaurs could be a crucial breakthrough in research into the origins of flight. The four-winged beast is known as a dromaeosaur, a subgroup of small, two-legged predators which scientists believe share a common ancestor with birds that lived about 130 million years ago. In recent years, China's become a mecca for paleontologists worldwide. New Yorkers are fed up with pigeons and their poop. So one city park has decided to do battle with the pigeons. Bryant Park is experimenting with hawks to scare away the pesky birds. With millions of them in Manhattan, it's no laughing matter for people wanting to enjoy sitting outside during their lunch breaks. The park lies in the heart of Manhattan, next to bustling Times Square, home to thousands of pigeons. Evidence of the pests is everywhere, with hundreds of droppings spattered all over the park, on the patios, the pavements, and of course on park benches. But now the pigeons have met their match. Mocker, the Harris hawk, who's been drafted in by Bryant Park to scare away the flocks of pigeons. Master falconer Tom Cullen, a leather glove running up his left arm, whistles commands to Mocker as they patrol the park. Although hawks don't normally feed on pigeons, the birds of prey scare them, building up their stress level and encouraging them to find food elsewhere. Besides the problem of droppings falling on New Yorkers, officials point out that pigeons are not a native species to the area and so really don't belong there. The good news is that while Mocha is flying around, the pigeons go into hiding. The bad news is that the moment Mocha is back in the cage, the park's pigeons' regulars are back, scratching around for more scraps of food. We'll see you next time on Animalia. Bye-bye.